Hello there, my friend. My name is Petula. I'm your host here at All Things Agile. Welcome back if you're returning. Welcome if this is your first time here. In this channel, we talk about all things that could really help you become a professional, effective Agile coach, one that drives results, one that really is able to help teams and whole organizations lead change. And in the previous video that I'm going to be showing in here, we were talking about how ineffective many team building activities are because they are fun and exciting and sometimes a little bit unbalanced on the fun side and not at all related to work. So critiquing is easy. In this video, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to go where the gold is at, which is proposing something better, suggesting what is it that you could really do as an agile coach to help build teams. What goes into that? And we're even going to discuss once more, what is the meaning or what is the place for fun and games, if any, in those kinds of activities? Are you interested? So let's get started. First, let's start with what is team building really? And I think the simple answer is building a team. Now we might have a misunderstanding here about what the team really means and what building could look like. Building a team is not socializing. And that's probably a hard thing to get in our minds because teams are social systems. That is a fact. But socializing, how we know in friendships and in personal life is a little bit different. And it's a condition that is not actually necessary for a team. So in here, I'm going to borrow from a study by Richard Hackman of the Harvard University and Ruth Wageman by, uh, from the Dartmouth College. And it's a study on team coaching. And they have a very interesting definition for teams, which is that they are real intact social systems, complete with boundaries, interdependency. So they are together, this one indivisible thing. And they have one or more group tasks to perform. So they don't exist in a vacuum. They have an objective somewhere. And they mentioned as well that teams operate in a social system context. So here is the part where sometimes you get a little bit confused. And one of the things that's important in that study is that they mentioned that team performance is understood by the perspective of the stakeholders. That is to say, you may love working with the people that you work, but your team is only performing regardless on how you feel about each other based on what your stakeholders perceive. If they perceive you as productive, if they perceive you as delivering great results, then you are a performing team, a team that has value. And you see that in that equation, they don't really use the interpersonal relationship piece. And one of the things I really like about that is because we get more and more connected in the world and interculturally. And we have teams that are one single big team across the globe. And it's sometimes confusing to imagine what socializing and what being friends like could look like in, in such a, a wide and spread array of social and cultural interconnection. So if you remove that piece, actually team performance, effectiveness, and competence becomes much easier to define and to go after. That basically posits that team effectiveness will be a function of the level of effort that team members are putting in the team themselves and in how they work together, the processes that they build and how they want to work, the appropriateness of the tasks that they have to perform, and the level of skill that they bring. So, so long as you are focusing or your result for those three elements of team performance, you are very likely to have then in your hands a team that's going to be high performance one. That then brings us to elements of the team building. How do we then focus on team building considering those three pieces? So here are four suggestions that then tackle these elements that are suggested by the study. The first element is the goal. So if you have one or more activities that focus on that, on understanding clearly what the goal for the team is, what is the mission to be achieved. And you can imagine workshops where you have whiteboards, you can imagine workshops where you have product managers and stakeholders coming to talk to the team about the problem, about the customer. You can have people going, you know, the team going and understanding how the customer faces certain problems 
problems or uses certain tools, anything that you can use so that the people, the team who will produce something really understand how they come together into achieving that goal. So it's not just a little statement here and there while we are developing app so and so. It is really beyond that. You have the team buy in and own and understand inside out what the goal looks like. That really is something that is extremely powerful to build your teams in a very solid way because they will face so much uncertainty as they go along, but they are super well versed into the very basic, the pillar of what brings them together, which is the goal, which is, you know, the objectives that their mission, their project, their application should be solving for someone somewhere at some point in time. The second one is building the team around the necessary tasks and skills that will be helpful, useful to achieving that goal. So as you can imagine, a team delivering all the visual assets in a market campaign has a set of skills that is different than a team who is developing an application in Java with Oracle database somewhere. Sometimes you might have a little bit of interconnectedness and teams could be a little bit more similar, but don't lose sight of the fact that specific tasks and skills for really achieving that goal. So any sort of training, workshops in which those skills are amplified and the team gets better at them are really building your team. And here is the interesting part is not sending people to do those trainings somewhere, but actually having them go through these activities together, have them go through the same workshop as a team. The important part is that not only I would need to become better at Photoshop or Java, but I need to become better at those things with my team. It's very different to be coding alone in my corner versus coding with a group of people that is just as responsible as I am for the final deliverable product. And that's, you know, encoding for a, in a professional setting for a professional application is very different than my little script on the side where I control everything from the quality to the looks of things. The next one is building the team around connected topics of interest. So that can be a little bit more of an umbrella one, but the team will need a few other things more so than just Photoshop or Java to get their work going. And it can be related to team dynamics and communication and performance. And you could literally have a lecture or a workshop defining and asking people, what are these things for you as a team? And then, you know, they will either consume content and then discuss or just creatively come up with the idea so that they start forming. What does that team look like? What does good communication look like for our team? What does a great team dynamic should look like? How are we going to notice that we are losing quality in whatever we are doing? How do we make sure that we maintain quality? So those are aspects that are a little bit less knowledge, but are still very important for the team to understand better how they want to create effective processes for them to work, to be able to perform those tasks, use those skills, and eventually achieve that goal. And another one is building teams around team effectiveness and team development models. I do have a video on a few of those in here. I suggest you go check it out. But basically it will all boil down to defining what is a great team, what are the ingredients and how do we as a team want to go about getting those. So as you can imagine, these activities will generate things like a team charter, a team working agreement, team effectiveness process, version one that we're going to have in our wiki. And that's kind of going to be like our rules of the game or our norms of conduct, whatever you want to call it. But as a team, we just basically decided this is how we want to work together. Those are the things that we consider so important that they need to be written somewhere so that they become guidepost rules for us as a team. So those might be things that you're actually a little bit more used to. And as you can see, they are fantastic to be done as a team is starting, but those things can and should be 
revisited throughout the life cycle of a team, especially when you have some moments, a little bit of downtime or after some major delivery, whether it was a big win or maybe even, you know, a result that you really needed to learn real hard lessons from. Those are great moments to make a bigger evaluation for the team as a whole. And I think this is a great moment to use something like team models to then do similar exercises for building the team around those. So now comes the question, can you use fun and games to build teams? And the answer is obviously yes. The caveat is pay attention to how much fun, because sometimes it is quite possible that the team get lost in the fun. And if you or whoever is facilitating the team building activity is not allocating enough time to discuss beyond the fun, what are the things that we learned about? What are the things that are the meta experiences hidden in the fun and in the game? It will just all amount to maybe a little bit too much fun and not enough knowledge and growth for the team. So one of the examples is the Lego serious play. It is a, a strategy for gamifying conversations. And basically you use Lego block to solve collective problems and it becomes a little bit of a language. You solve anything, you talk about anything by using your block. And as a new language, you create a few layers of abstraction, which are just enough for you to get a little bit more distant from the problem itself and get a little bit more creative. And the other thing that those games and new languages they bring is that because of that distance as well, you end up being able to talk about stuff that usually would be a little bit more difficult if you had to be very direct. So these games, they can be very, very useful. They offer layers and layers of nuance, which is something that is really interesting. You can go deeper with people without necessarily being too personal. But as a facilitator, you have to be experienced both in the technology that you're using and in asking the questions and in paying attention to the group to make sure that you will help them extract the learning after the fun and giggles. So gamified approaches to solving complex problems help you simplify the language that you're using and they tend to be quite effective and you can do that basically at any given point in time. But then once again, remember fun is not the objective. The learning is the objective and it doesn't hurt that we have some fun in the process, right? Pay attention though, that fun is not a universal concept. Cultural differences will play a part and neurotypical diversity will play a part and so many other things. So that actually makes me remember a few very interesting activities that I had with teams, um, sometimes using Play-Doh and Post-it. I'm actually really big in creating completely different scenarios. And for this team, they were building a house with Play-Doh and Post-its. And we had so many weeks to build that house. And there was an idea about the cycles of deliverables that we had. And eventually there was not enough material because the team started using all the materials up front and changes were coming and then they, they had committed to a lot of elements in the house already. So all that offered for us quite the space to first debrief in the context of the house building and then bringing that to remembering that they are the very same team with a similar issue in the world of software development and what would that look like for them as an extraction of knowledge. So it was quite interesting. I suggest that if you really do those activities that you get very creative and you go very intentional in the game so that you really can create an environment for the team to take way more lessons than the ones that you were trying to give to them. The point is that you create a space and you pay attention to all the things that they do so that you then can ask questions and they can start noticing all the patterns and all the things that are coming up for them. So it's not you with a message being injected on them, but creating the space for them to design their own effectiveness, their own team processes and their own quality, et cetera, et cetera. So there you have it, my friend. That is the discussion around building teams. What really goes into it? What kind of activities do you really design that helps you to help your team to become more effective, more performing and achieving the results that they were tasked to achieve? Thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was useful. If you're not subscribed already, consider doing so so that you don't miss any video and comment down below if there's a question that you have or if there's something in the video that you particularly agree or 
completely disagree with, I'd love to hear from you. I'll stop this video here and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now.